I'm excited to be here, in, in part because I've never been to you and you married, and I realized as I'm working on China that this institute has so many people who have been working on development issues for a long, long time that I felt like in the spirit of absorptive capacity, I at least need to meet and connect to this institute um, so that uh, I can learn from you. And as you will see later in the talk, I'm going to be inviting you to co-design a study with me. This is going to be the, the Q&A session. So actually what I've done after talking a little bit to Eddie, I shifted a bit the, the, the focus of my presentation. So the announced topic will be towards the end of the presentation, but I want to set the stage a little bit of why this actually is an, an important question. And in that way, I can tell you about my, the work that I already have done on the Chinese dye industry in recent years with uh, Hong Yang, who's now at the Academy of Social Sciences. And I should also tell you that a current doctoral student of mine uh, is working with me on the newer subjects that I will also be speaking about. So here's a quick roadmap, and I'm going to go like the Eurostar, a bullet train, because I want to do both dye industry and the topic I announced, so I'm going to be, go really fast. If you have any questions about that needs to be clarified, because I'm just, just not clear what I'm saying, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask the question. In terms of substantive question, I would like to wait until about minute 40, and then we can have general, de general debates. Um, but don't hesitate to ask me if I'm not clear. So, so, so here's the roadmap. So I first will talk a, about a little bit about my previous work on the dynasty. Eddie already alluded to this, and I want to give great thanks to a person who is in mastery. I've actually been to mastery probably 10 times, never in this institute. But my work on the dye industry could have not been done without the collaboration of Ernst Humburg, a professor of history here uh, at Maastricht. I will then present to you two studies that I've done with Hong Yang on the Chinese dye industry. And then I'm going to ask the question leading to my current topic. Well, can China continue the development model exemplified by the dye industry if it wants to catch up with the West? And I'm going to outline two positions that are literature, and I'm going to have you vote. You will not, you have to vote which position you think is the one way to go, and then we talk about, well, how would we actually research this if we are serious? Eddie already mentioned uh, the book. In the book, I'm basically trying to explain a shift of industrial leadership from the leading country where the first dyes were invented in Great Britain, then France was also leading, but it shifted to Germany, and Germany dominated its industry. Let me just show you a couple of simple stats. This is world market share in 1862, five years into the industry. And as you can see, green Britain and purple France are leading this industry with 50 and 40% market share. And at the time, all the experts said, well, of course, Britain is going to dominate this even further because the raw materials are here, coal tar, a waste product of making illuminating gas, and the demand, the textile industry, is here. So it's obvious. Well, it didn't happen that way. Nine years later, Germany is dominating this industry with 50% market share, and then in the next 10 years, it pushes up the market share to 75, 80, 85%. And this is the market share, about 85% that Germany has between 1880 and 1930. And so what I did in my book, I tried to explain, well, how come this reversal of fortune from Britain to Germany, how come this came about? And in the book, I make a lot of arguments. But the key arguments are this has to do with differences in national patent systems, the fact that Germany didn't have a patent system in the beginning and later on instituted one and only processed patents. And secondly, with the university system, I said that the fact that Germany had more organic chemists and then also was able, the German universities and German government responded more quickly to increase the number of chemical laboratories at universities and the supply of chemists, which then became really important in staffing the large R&D laboratories. The dye industry was the f industry where R&D laboratories were invented for the first time, that employees would only fun uh, focus on research and not being production chemists. That was the, air, uh, the place where this happened. Now, I'm going very fast here. The dye industry historically only happened once. So people can ask me, Peter, how are you sure there are so many variables interacting, firms, policies, countries? How come you're, you can be sure that this, you know, that your causal analysis is correct? 
And so recently, uh, Thomas Brennan and I presented at the Schumpeter Conference a simulation of the argument. We created, you may have heard of the history-friendly simulation, it's sim somewhat related to this. And basically here I can, uh, the reason why I bring this up is because I want to talk about simulation a bit later on. In the simulation, we could show that, yes, the higher number of initial chemists in Germany in 1857 leads to more startups, more firms, but only sometimes to more firms in 1913, which only sometimes have a higher collective German market share. Well, what does it depend on? And we can show in the simulation that it depends crucially on the responsiveness of the German university system, the relatively faster responsiveness of the German university system compared to the British and to the French. I'm going very fast. I just wanted to give you in your head, we can also do simulations in terms of testing the, the, the logic of the explanation. Now, I want you to focus on the left side of this diagram. This is 1913. <coughs> As you can see, as I just said, Germany almost has full global market share, right? They dominate the industry. Does everyone see this? Now I want you to go to the right. In 1977, as you can see, Germany is not doing the majority of this. You see China coming in 1977, the U.S. producing, and now I'm going to fast forward this, and I want you to focus on 2007. In 2007, China has... 50% of global dye production. And so I was interested in 2007 to figure out, well, how did the Chinese do this? You know, historically, I just told you universities are very, very important. Historically, there was a science, this was a high-tech industry. Now, I, I can tell you right now, this was no longer high-tech, but there's still a question, how did the Chinese actually acquire the knowledge and know-how to start dye production and then uh, become the world leader in terms of production. Now to just give you a little map, I know many of you are working on China. These are the different regions where dye production uh, is, is, taking, uh, is taking place. And I want you to uh, want to show you a first study that I did with Hong Yang, where as we are working on the dye industry, we discover a very interesting pattern. All of you who are working on China are aware that from 1978 to today, 1978, state-owned enterprises dominated the economy. Then from 78 to 92, this collect these so-called collective enterprises become very strong in certain sectors of the economy. And then we all know the story that, well, later on, it's the private companies, which in many sectors are dominating and becoming leaders. Now, let me show you an interesting pattern. So, in 1978, dye production is all in terms of state-owned enterprises. Then the leadership from 1978 to 1992 moves to collectively-owned enterprises. But, and this is the interesting pattern, it's not collectively-owned enterprises in Shanghai that become the leaders. No, that transition to a different, you can call it corporate form, also required the transition to a different location, a different region in China. So the first transition is from Shanghai to Jiangsu, and in Jiangsu, collectively owned enterprises are leaders. And then there's a second transition, when the transition to private enterprise happened, it's again not private companies in Shanghai or in Jiangsu that spring up and come to dominate this. No, again, there's a requirement to actually transition into a different region, in this case, Sejong. And what we, had, what we uh, basically did in the uh, Industrial Corporate Change paper is, first of all, to demonstrate that if you look here at three different regions and black is, is China as a whole, as you can see, the red line is Sejong, the third region. Sejong completely is dominating dye production by 2008. And what we did in this first paper, we tried to explain this and basically my earlier book was on how national institutions determine success. This paper is how oh, actually our regional institutions and differences in the regional institutions are driving industrial success and are driving the, the patterns of change that we, that we are seeing. And so basically, we, uh, if, you, if you go back to the causal diagram, so what we are talking about in the paper is that incentives of the actors drive why they're adopting certain forms. In local government officials uh, if they're Shanghai, they need to secure the SOEs, local employment stability, economic growth, personal interests, 
the non-covenant entrepreneurs they want profits, but basically is the, the, the key difference are degree of central supervision. So the, the Chinese central government, as many of you know, kept a much tighter grip on what is happening in Shanghai, didn't allow uh, these experiments to go on. They were much more focused on labor stability and providing welfare in, in Shanghai. The degree of property, propertyized ambiguity basically is, in these other regions, they exploited the fact that, so for example, in the third region, later on they became private enterprises, but initially they registered them as collective enterprises, but they were de facto privately owned. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, give you a quick sense of what we did uh, in this first study, and I'm, I'm going to focus now uh, more on a study that we haven't published, but we have uh, worked on a great deal, and, and, and this is trying to answer the question, well, what types of knowledge are acquired by new venture startups from incumbent firms through the entrepreneur incumbent network, relationship doing foundations? So basically, it became very, very clear as we were starting to interview people who were running these companies that they acquired the knowledge from connections to the old state on enterprises in 1978. Mm -hmm. And so this study is trying to ascertain, well, exactly what type of knowledge was transferred and how did they get the connections. And then we'll ask you, you know, what type of knowledge transfer is, is, is most important, not just for the startup, for the, for the long-term success of the industry. <coughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first do a little bit of a literature review for the second study, talk your sampling and data analysis findings, and then I'm going to induce at the end some to general proposition that we can test with data from other industries in more general terms. In the world of industry evolution and industry development, Steve Klepper and others have done a lot of work on what you know, what kind of firms have you in a long time? And it turned out there are a lot of startups are actually being spawned from incumbent firms who have disagreements with existing management, and they start, for example, if good Intel is Fairchild, the children of Fairchild, Intel, and many of the, of the semiconductor companies in, in Silicon Valley were formed because of a uh, spin-out process of employee, employees leaving. And so basically, uh, the networks is very important for this. Um, incumbent firms are an essential source of knowledge, and knowledge gained through an entrepreneurial relationship is more likely to be unique. You, everyone can read the papers in the literature, but in terms of unique knowledge, it's more likely to come from network ties than from reading the, the literature. But there's considerable ambiguity in the literature as to what are the precise knowledge flows that go on. So Steve Klepper, for instance, in his work, he had a dummy, are you working, have you been working at a successful large enterprise? Yes, no. And then he can show econometrically that those companies which had a employee coming from the successful large enterprises, they do better in terms of survival. So the econometric exercise is very clear that having this helps, but just because you have a dummy variable saying there is one doesn't tell you at all what does this person actually bring with him or her. So what are the uh, precise, well, also, we have not looked at what are the precise relational contents of the network that brings us along. Uh, I'm going to skip this here. And then there is, is well, I'm going to give you an overview. Here are all of the things that have been purported to flow through these uh, ties. Technology and knowledge, ideas and innovation, information about technologies and prospects, technological distant knowledge, functional knowledge, know how to manage R&D, R&D generated knowledge, similar skills, information about emerging markets, market pioneering know-how, know how to design organizations, business model, the list goes on and on of all the things that potentially could be useful in transferring knowledge from incumbent firms to new startups via uh, employee mobility. So to summarize, we lack research on the precise knowledge flows in entrepreneur and company relationships, and we need to make more progress on examining the exact detailed knowledge flows, what is flowing, and you cannot do this with an econometric exercise where you just code a dummy yes or no, you actually have to interview people and have to try to find out what is actually uh, going on. 
So here are the research questions that we are pursuing in this research. What types of knowledge are acquired by new venture startups from incumbent firms through the entrepreneur incumbent network relationships during the foundation period? And we basically operationalize this from zero to four years. And what knowledge is transferred in the manner <coughs> is most helpful for the long-term success? And long-term success, we operationalize here that you're actually surviving for 10 years and you're still in business. Let me define a couple of terms. New venture startup, new firms founded by an independent individual entrepreneur rather than by a corporation starting a new line of business. As you know, a lot of corporates do also new ventures. That does not qualify in our definition here. Incumbent firms are existing firms within the industry that the new firm enters. And incumbent, entrepreneur incumbent relationships are startup founders' personal network relationships with full-time incumbent employees, excluding business relationship between startups and incumbents. So we are actually looking at, because it's before, right, what are the personal relationships that uh, folks have. Now, in terms of sample, we are looking at six private new venture startups created in 1978 in the synthetic industry in the province of Zhejiang. This is the third region. I told you the migration, right, from region one, Shanghai, to two, to Zhejiang. Why post-1978 Chinese, Chinese synthetic dye industry there were 500 to 800 entries. Initially, we thought we would do an econometric study of this, but we just couldn't get information on these 500 to 800 startups. And by the way, for those of you who study Chinese industries, those patterns of massive entries on a scale not seen anywhere in the world happens in many of them. Right now, there are 400 Android smartphone companies in China. Make all that little variation of that Android. It's just Staggering scale. There's great variance in the long-term performance across these startups. And in the 40s, the founding company relationship deemed as the only reliable source of initial knowledge by all the respondents in our pilot study. So as we were talking, <coughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit later what did we actually ask those folks. When Hong was in the field many times, she always, she started here as, look, we had a relationship to somebody from Shanghai Dye Stuff Company, number, factory number eight. This is how this was transferred. They came to work and worked out a plan on the weekend in order to help us with the startup uh, uh, production. I'm going to get into that in more detail. Why Sejong? Sejong? Large performance differences among the, the firms. And secondly, to now control, this is very, very important if you're doing case studies, because you've got to justify why these cases, not others. We are now controlling for regional differences by only looking at companies in the third region. So we are holding constant the institutional context. And now we are going to tr trying to ask, given this is constant, what decided why some firms do well and other firms do poorly? In Zhejiang, not in China, Zhejiang, and that, that is very crucial. Now, Ownership forms, they're all privately owned since establishment. One firm actually launched an IPO on the stock market in the 2000s. Found the backgrounds, they were all farmers. And for those of you who have never done work in China, you say, all farmers, come on, you must be kidding. How can they start a dye company? I don't have time today to go into this, but if you are wondering how come people without university education are doing a lot of entrepreneurship in China, I just re recently read this book by Victor Ne which is fantastic. I told Stefania yesterday about this. Read this book, and then you have a much deeper understanding of what actually happened in, in China in terms of bottom-up development of the Chinese economy. Um, no prior entrepreneurial experience. So they, they, they hadn't been entrepreneurs before. No industry specific experience, no senior management experience, no one went to university, and they're financially weak. So they're all the same, and now we can actually focus on, well, what determined still that some of them did really well and did really poorly? There are also uh, polar cases in a sense of, and this is, for those of you doing case study, my simple rule is never do a case study of one case. Always have a point of comparison. If you're studying successful one, find an unsuccessful company or an unsuccessful region. The hardest part for Hong in this and for us is, was actually to find the companies that did poorly because they're short-lived and nobody knows what happened to them. So that was the hardest part of the research. And let me tell you, give you a little bit of overview of these cases. I'm not going to go detail. It just shows you when they were founded. They are farmers, source of knowledge. In this case, it turned out different parts of the Shanghai SOE, the ISTAF SOE, was a source of knowledge for all of them. 
in terms of number of employees of foundation, some started with 10, some started with 70, and now number of employees in 2009, and this is a key performance measure, uh, LRS, 6,500, high performance. The second one is 1,600. The marginal performance are 300. The failure doesn't have anyone, and there's one failure which was around until uh, 1995, and then at the time when they went out of business in 1995, they had about uh, 80 employees. <coughs> so how do we do this? I already told you that we couldn't get, unlike before with, in, my, in my book, because of the help of Ernst Homburg, we created a global database of all the dye firms that ever left a trace anywhere in any director. Okay, for China, this simply was not doable. So secondhand data on company documents, new papers, trade organizations. But the key in terms of getting knowledge about what, what knowledge was transferred were 59 open-ended interviews that Hong did between 2009 and 2011. I actually need to update this. She had to go, I sent her back into the field uh, earlier this, this year because we needed to ask follow-up questions in order to really nail this paper. <coughs> there are insiders, they're founding entrepreneurs, they're managerial personnel, R&D personnel, but they're also outsiders. They are industry expert, there are um, people from competitors, there are chemists, there are university professors. And here's the crucial thing. We did not ask them, we think this type of knowledge is really important to start this up. Can you please confirm this? We didn't. We asked them, giving no hints about our research interests, very open ended and very broad. We are curious why did you want to start up a dye firm and how did your firm perform over the years? Okay? And then say, and then start more. So, you know, why did you do this? Why did you then interact with the state owned enterprise? You know, basically, not trying to confirm what we already believe, but really letting them articulate what their causal view is of how, the, how this happened. I don't have time to talk about the data analysis in great detail, but basically we used NVivo 8 and did multiple rounds of, of qualitative data coding in, to come up with the categories. I'm just gonna focus on the last stage in, in the coding here where how did we actually come up with the different types of knowledge that were transferred. So basically, um, what I wanted to do was to have emerge from the coding, not categories like tacit and non-tacit explicit, because again, these are categories that are really not in the interviews, right? You would have to actually make a judgment yourself about whether this is tacit or explicit. I wanted to have what I call knowledge categories that make sense to anyone I present is including you. In the sense of this, um, so basically we, we, we made two big types. Functional knowledge, which is technical knowledge about manufacturing techniques for particular products, marketing and sales knowledge, knowledge about market information, distribution expertise, sales skills, procurement knowledge, where you get the raw materials, who are the uh, suppliers, R&D management knowledge, how do you go about managing an R&D system to organize R&D projects? And operation knowledge is about effective rule for workshop supervision. So we call this, and you can think about this in, in, in simple functional organization of a firm, the head manager of a function, what type of knowledge would that person have to have to, uh, to do this? And then the second category of knowledge that emerged as we are coding and analyzing what the people are saying to us, we call this strategic knowledge. And let me tell you what we mean by this. Knowledge that guides firms' understanding of market opportunities and their positioning in the market. So I may be the chemist, and I may make a blue reactive dye, but I may have absolutely no clue about whether the market is big for this and who is going to buy this, okay? So this is the kind of, this is, this is a market now. Sec secondly, knowledge for, for selecting technical trajectory. This is knowledge related to the different technical trajectories a firm or principal could follow for particular products and how to select the proper one from these trajectories. So again, I'm not going to go into detail. For those of you who have worked on technologies, and you know that typically different technologies out there Different, different ways to, to, uh, uh, to solve a problem. To give you a, a, a modern version of this, go back when Android first came out, you as a software startup need to make a decision, shall I 
take my iPhone application and also adapt it to Android, or should I just take the iPhone? That's a similar sort of strategic decision that you make. Later on, when Android overtakes the iPhone, that's an obvious uh, decision. Early on, when Android is the second follower, that is not as obvious uh, a decision. Okay, so this would be an example of this. And now I'm going to um, show you what we formed in terms of whether, so remember we have six cases, two high performing one, two medium performing one, and two poorly performing countries. And now we're looking at whether or not the interviewees that we, that we interviewed from these six companies, whether or not they spoke about these different types of knowledge and how this was distributed. In brackets, you see the number of interviews, so the number of interviewees who mentioned that type of knowledge in their interviews. So in the high performing cases, they all got every type of the functional knowledge that we talked about. This is just a requirement uh, to do well. And they all talked about that we, need, we obtained from our network ties in the state of enterprises strategic knowledge. In the case of the poorly performing cases, they obtain also all the technical knowledge because otherwise, remember, they're farmers. You, there's no way you can start production if you don't acquire the technical know-how. But they don't get, at least in interviews, they don't report to us we are get, they got the strategic knowledge. In the case of the outright failures, and they also got technical knowledge, although yet less, but they also didn't get any of the strategic knowledge based on these interviews. So let me give you an example of what kind of knowledge transfer uh, are we talking about. So here is the is advisor is experienced incumbent employee, Mr. He, previous director of the state-owned Shanghai Number no. 8 Dyster factory. And the advisee is Hyun, the founder of Gi WG Dye Company. Initially, DWG is producing all sorts of dyes. They're just trying to imitate everyone. And then they focus, in the beginning of the third year, on one dye, CI Reactive Blue number 19. Now, how did, they, how did Mr. Hume suddenly say, well, after three years, you know, I should focus on this dye? Well, it, he basically got a strong suggestion from Mr. Key that you really want to focus on this dye. At this time already, the prices were coming down. There's more competition to survive this. So what do you do? Focus on number 19 because it's a multifunctional dye which can work in many different textiles. So the market of this is going to be much bigger. And so that idea didn't come from Jung himself. For those of you who are iPhone users, and you follow the history of Apple, the idea for taking Apple into consumer electronics didn't come from Steve Jobs, it was a board member who told Steve when he came back and became the CEO again. So this is a similar process. You don't have to come up with the ideas yourself, but somebody who has insights into the, into the market is important. So basically to uh, just summarize, the Functional knowledge is clearly necessary to start and so to survive uh, for a couple of years. But if you want to survive over a long period of time, long-term success, basically the strategic knowledge is what separates the successful companies, those who obtain strategic knowledge from existing companies, sorry, existing employees, they survived. And I already told you about this uh, knowledge for selecting a product. I, I just want to uh, show you another example. So choosing more promising product types. Here's another example uh, of the case of Jim. Namely, Jim is a poorly performing case. The, the, the case of Jim, so they only had technologies for producing two types of dyes. With no advice from coming employees, the founder didn't realize that the importance of electing particular dyes. So they just continued basically making the same dyes and got, went out of business. So let me in introduce, induce two propositions from this. Clearly, we have only, in this case, studied the dye industry from 1978 to 2008. But from this inductive study, we can generalize two propositions which we believe makes a contribution to the literature on knowledge gaining from incumbents to, to startups. 
For a new venture startup in a te technologically mature industry, acquisition of functional knowledge via the new incumbent relationships at the time of founding increased their probability of short-term survival, but does not have significant influence on the probability of their long-term superior performance. Proposition two, for a new venture startups in a techni technically mature industry, acquisition of strategic knowledge via the entrepreneur incumbent relationship at the time of founding does not have significant influence on their probability of short-term survival. So the strategic knowledge actually is not that important in the beginning, but becomes very, very important in the long-term uh, uh, survival. Now, what are the contributions of this? We are filling in major gaps, as I told you before, in terms of what knowledge actually flows. Now, as I'm talking to people privately, you know, I've heard, for example, somebody who studies Silicon Alley in New York, the same sort of thing. There are a lot of people who have the technical knowledge, but in terms of what differentiates some of the firms that survive is actually understanding of the markets, and they often don't have that. And so connection to people who understand the markets uh, is, is, is crucial for this. We also identified the mechanism, in this case, the network. I completely underplayed the importance of the network and how these networks are formed. Now, one of the criticisms uh, on the draft of the paper was, well, how do you guys know that these networks were in existence at the beginning? And how do you know this is not due to some people are better networkers? So they established the networks after startup in order then to gain the knowledge. And so Hong went back to the field and tried to actually get a deep understanding when did these network ties actually form so we can Establish, in fact, and for those of you who are studying China, family ties, ties to your location, to your village, are, are the strong ties. And, 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 and I think uh, we can show that the pre-existing ties are actually the, 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 the crucial ones, although they're forming a couple of others. The limitations. Now, what are limitations? One of them, of course, is we are asking people retrospectively what happened. We all know, as we're getting older, that oftentimes we actually don't fully re-remember. Eddie just thought, you know, Schumpeter Prize was four years ago. It was ten years ago. So there, is, uh, uh, there are limitations uh, to this. And the second one, and I'm transitioning to the topic that I wanted to discuss with you, uh, or that I announced, well, the Chinese in the dynasty is economically really not that important. I showed you uh, in terms of employees, the largest firm, you know, 10,000 employees, but, you know, compared to uh, the Foxconn factories that are making the iPhones, there are a lot more people working, uh, making Apple iPhones in China than, 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 than the Dai. And so if I wanted to make some general statements of, about the, Ch or the Chinese economy where it's going, the Dai industry is not necessarily representative and may not be uh, 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 the best model. Secondly, the technological frontier of this industry was stable. In 1978, there are no new Dai's. In textile markets, there are some dyes, it turns out, in the screen here that actually dyes, but the market of dyes for these screens is infinitely small compared to how much dyes you need to color one of these uh, suits. So the frontier is stable, so that raises the question, well, well how, how would knowledge transfer happen in, in, in industries where the frontier is moving fast? And so then I said, okay, now I'm going to study an industry where the frontier is fast, where it's high tech. So last year I started to really become serious about the solar industry. I mentioned this yesterday evening a little bit. And it turns out that the solar industry is also not a industry with a, high, uh, with a frontier of the technology moving fast. The current solar technology is all with technology that is quite, quite old, although there's R&D going on advanced, but it's not right now infiltrating uh, uh, into production. And so then I became, said, okay, I was in China last year and I started to really look for cases where there may be a frontier moving. And to make a long story short, I actually think that WeChat, social networking, uh, internet technologies is the place where uh, China is doing really, really creative stuff. And, um, and again, I, I, I can only tell you that this is what I'm doing. I don't have time today to actually talk about this because I want to talk about something else, namely, the question is, can China continue the development model exemplified by the uh, Chinese dye industry if it wants to catch up with the most advanced countries? And my initial reaction was, of course, no. Let me show you where this intuition was coming from. This is a distribution of value capturing in iPhone production. The red, the biggest chunk, is Apple's profits. And if you go to the top, you see China, 
China labor input, China non-labor input, 3.5%, 1.8%. Foxconn is a Taiwanese-owned uh, company, if, if correct, 0.5%. So I said to myself, look, the reason why the US and the European countries have a higher GDP per capita than China right now is obviously because they have technologies which, are, which you know, we, where they're capturing a much higher uh, part of the value in China, all they're doing, they're, they're manufacturing this. Okay, and so it said to me, you can almost put it simply, well, you need to have more apples, Apple companies in the economy if you want to have a high GDP per capita. That seemed to me the obvious. And when I looked into the literature, and for those of you working in China, of course, you know all this, the State Council of China put out a national medium to long-term program for science and technologies in 2006, which agrees with this, right? You more or less you want. And I'm going to walk you through what the argument is, but um, let's have more companies which are in in high tech sectors where we can have high value added and capture high value added. And then, as I'm getting into this, I'm. Again, for those of you who are working on innovation in China, you would have heard about this, this book I come across, The Run of the Red Queen, Bresnitz and Murphy, Murphy, which said, this is completely wrong-headed. The idea that China, in the medium term, should try to become, you know, have more apples in the world, that you know, doesn't make any sense. I'm exaggerating a bit here. So let me walk through a little bit what the arguments are. So basically, you know, and I, I, you know, and I summarize this, the, the, the report of State Council, in my mind, says imitate the innovation system of the advanced countries and invest in frontier science and technology sectors. That's the way how we are going to get to the next level of GDP per capita growth. And I'm going to get up a little bit, and for those, you know, it's basically, so they committed themselves to increasing investment in science 2.5%. If you look at patenting trends, amazing increase in patenting over, over uh, the years. So. They also commit themselves to strengthening IP because that induces firms to spend their, uh, money on R&D, upgrade firm capabilities, and then we can create sectors of the economy that can surpass the technological frontier. So uh, similarly, we are going to focus on support of indigenous uh, innovation. We want to reduce the amount of foreign technology being used and have local technology. And they said, for example, they created their own 3G standard, tried to create a standard, Improve in science and engineering institutes. So this is standard arguments for how, you know, you can think about it as how would you actually become more like the U.S. and more like Europe. And I want to spend a bit more time to walk through the Bresnitz and Murphy because it, this, is, this is a complete pipe dream, this they don't plan. They, they say if you really look at what's going on in China is, China's Chinese firms in many sectors are very, very good at rapid imitation absorbing uh, knowledge from abroad. They basically say the idea that uh, the Chinese companies should be doing first generation technology is not the way where the, where the low hanging fruit is. Low hanging fruit, they say, is because of globalization, there is a complete fragmentation of the global uh, uh, production chains. So you can actually focus on a very small part of the iPhone and become the leader in that technology and capture value. And that is feasible given the institutional and political context um, of, of China. Why? Ba basically, basically, Bresnitz and Murphy say there is an amazing amount of structured, what they, what they call structured uncertainty uh, in, in China, meaning the government is not a singular force. Would actually, yes, they have this policy of science technology, but they have other policies in terms of growth, in their policies in terms of um, employment growth, which actually completely con you know, are orthogonal or contradict this. And so, if you look at China, de facto is there is a greater uncertainty because depending on what faction right now is dominating the Communist Party, in three years from now, the rules could change. Three years from now, they may actually nationalize again uh, a technology that's very important. And so you as an individual private entrepreneur, you have no incentives in investing in long-term R&T because you never know whether you can appropriate, whether you get there, because, whether you can appropriate it. So the political Chinese systems is, in their view, 
not conducive to long-term R&D, which would be required to have first-generation um, te technologies. And I said, wow, this is pretty interesting. You know, I, I was with the state council, uh, and now uh, they are writing this in book. And so I said to myself, well, how would we actually know who is correct? So what I first want to do is, I want to take a poll. Everyone has to vote here. You cannot, even if you don't know, say, well, I just go into, intuitively, this strikes me. So basically, to just summarize again, state on council, let's quickly focus on becoming like the US, doing high-tech science, and from that high-tech science, creating first-generation technologies, and thereby improve our GDP per capita by having uh, higher value added science versus Bresnitz and Murphy saying, look, let the US invest in this, in the expensive one, let's be a quick follower and then you know, be very flexible and, and develop the uh, uh, second generation technology and focus on certain uh, uh, parts of the value chain. And that in the medium term is a, a more effective way to increase GDP per capita.